Okay, everybody. So I hope you all had some time to look at the exercises. Um, and I will just quickly show you some example solution, maybe discuss like some intricacies here. So, so um, the first like exercise was to basically classify the samples using the data. And maybe the first traps that I put here is I didn't really tell you what table to use. So there were quite some strategies here. You could have used the uh, abundance tables that you got from data two. You could have used the genus level table that we had, or you could have used the rarified table from the diversity analysis. And rarified um, basically means that you subsampled each of the samples in a way that they have exactly the same number of reads. Um, which kind of advantages and disadvantages. The obvious advantage is that now every single sample contains exactly the same total number of reads. So you kind of remove the effect of library size. Um, but also if you have, for instance, rarify everything to 10,000 reads and you had 100,000 reads in a sample, I mean, you're kind of only analyzing 10,000 of the 100,000 reads in there. So you lose some data there. Um, this is why like there's always that kind of an, uh, like a trade-off between kind of using rarified data or maybe log transforming it and all of that. Um, in this case, like if you did it with the rarified table, that's fine. You could also use the genus table. Um, and then you would have put in the metadata file again. And that metadata file in the beginning we saw had that column disease status that told us who's healthy and who is um, actually has a recurrent C. diff infection. And that's kind of what we wanted to predict, right? So that's what you would have put as metadata column. That's the output. Um, and I also put like an n jobs parameter here of two. That's kind of how many CPUs you want to use to run that analysis. It can make it a bit faster. Um, in the Google Colab environment, we have two CPUs. I mentioned that in the beginning really shortly. Um, so I'm going to use two CPUs here. <clears throat> Sorry. And then we have our output directory, which is basically the classifier. Um, directory where we would have saved the data, for instance. And I think most of you actually managed to run something very similar. And it would have given you quite some files you could look at. Um, I told you to look at the heat map visualization, which kind of looked similar to what we generated beforehand, which was kind of that thing here. Um, but now either it would have done that for each individual um, amplicon sequence variant. If you would have used the genus level data, it might have looked very similar, but you only probably use two columns, uh, two rows, sorry, because it kind of summarizes that across all samples, like it's kind of either two example samples or the mean. Um, and then you could have also looked at the accuracy and that would have told you like how well that actually does in predicting the C diff state. And that would have been the accuracy results visualizations. It actually would have told you that it's almost perfect in differentiating um, sick from healthy individuals. Um, but there's a little problem here. Um, and that's that we only have eight samples in our data set. So that's, that's not really a big study. Like most 16S amplicon sequencing studies, those days have almost thousands of samples, um, hundreds to thousands. That's like in one of the largest American gut project by now has up to 30,000 samples, for instance. So that's like a very different dimension of data points that we have here. Um, and it turns out that we often get that problem with like low number of samples, we get like overfitting. So basically, since we kind of, um, the machine learning methods that kind of does that classification can basically has a lot of different parameters that can fit to the data way more than we actually have data points. So it kind of over captures the actual data. It doesn't generalize well. So if you would give it like data that's not from that experiment, it would probably do a pretty bad job of classifying it. And we will look at that a little bit in the second part of the course, like because we do something similar with the MyCom analysis. And I will show you that there is a difference between using the entire data, training data, or kind of doing it with um, data that hasn't been used for training. So we would do a decent job. We kind of saw that. We probably would still have a problem with in correctly classifying that one recurrent C. diff individual that looked almost like a normal healthy person. And in the second exercise, if you wanted to do that, I kind of had you like visualize the phylogenetic tree a little bit. And that's kind of what you can get in the final output. Um, what I did here is basically I loaded the tree in there and then I actually said ignore the branch lengths. So yours might look like a distorted version of it. 
Um, what we have here is often called a cladogram. So it's still exactly the same thing. If two things are close, they are still very similar. Um, but the length of the branch is not directly associated for sequence to sequence similarity again. It's just like a way to kind of show it so it all has the same maximum length basically here. Um, and then the first thing that happened is if you um, imported the taxonomy data, it actually changed the names of all the leaves where before you actually had those like weird um, random IDs for the Amplicon sequence variants and now got substituted with the actual taxonomic classification. So if you zoom in that um, on ITOL, you can actually see exactly what's the classification for each of the individual um, Amplicon sequence variants. And one thing that was pretty obvious here is if you look at a few of them, you get like that they're only classified at a very high level. Like you get no genus or not even a family for them. And that happens as well. If there's like no sequence in the database, that's pretty informative for that um, Amplicon sequence variant, they might just tell you, oh, well, it's a bacteria, but I don't know more than that about it. So that was also to kind of see that you will get like different levels of um, taxonomy for each of them. And then if you actually import it, for instance, the rarefied abundances, you kind of saw that each of them was kind of annotated with the abundance in each sample. So you could have seen, for instance, that there's one um, ASV that's actually kind of dominating almost. It's like really abundant. Um, I think that's a bacteroides, I think. Um, and you also saw that there's, for instance, others that might only be present in a single sample, for instance, and not really in any others. Um, and why did we use the rarefied table? Well, Again, if we wouldn't have corrected for the library size, so the total number of reads in each sample, this might be misrepresented a little bit. <clears throat> for instance, if I see like more red here, but that comes from a sample that had like 10 times more reads than any other sample, that might actually mean that like by proportion, that's actually not that abundant in the sample, but still just because we had more reads in that sample, it gets overrepresented here. There's other um, ways to do that. You could have, like, for instance, you can do relative abundances where you kind of divide by the overall number of reads. You can do the, like, the centered log ratio transform that we did before. But all of that would have been harder to get into ITOL, which is why I recommended to use the rarefied tables here. OK. Um, yeah, that was it for the exercises here. Um, if you have additional questions, you can still put them in the Slack, and we will respond to them. Um, but actually, just to motivate the second session a little bit. So we're actually at a pretty good stage right now. So we started out with like weird raw sequencing data and no human would have made any sense out of that. And by now we have a pretty good understanding what's going on. Like we, for instance, we have seen that um, individual recurrent C. diff infection have a lower diversity. So there's less, um, like that's kind of, like they're less diverse in the individual samples. We also saw that they really um, are different from healthy individuals like in, in better diversity. So there is like in a global microbiome states are kind of very different from each other, except for one um, sick individual that actually looked more like it was a healthy individual. Um, and then if we looked at the genera, we did see that there are like clusters of genera that like seem to be kind of more associated with the disease and others that are more associated with the healthy state. So the obvious question now is kind of how that does that work, right? Like, are those differences in taxic um, abundances here, do they actually have a metabolic consequence? That's really what we might be interested in. Because, yeah, it's cool to see that there are bacteria there, but in the end, we are scientists or, we, or we're just curious and we want to understand what's really going on. So how does that kind of impact that C. diff can actually get into that system and infect? Because, I mean, you might say, oh, okay, if you have bacteroides, it seems to be protective, but how does it do that, right? Um, so we might want to be really um, interested in is, is there something that bacteroides does? Does it produce a metabolite that makes it hard for C. diff or what's really going on in that system? And that's kind of a question of functional analysis. So you, now you want to see what is the function perpetrated by the microbiome that actually enables, for instance, a healthy state or makes you less healthy. Um, and that's what we'll be looking at in the second point. Um, so there's actually no code for the cladogram. It's just an option. So if you open that tree in ITOL, maybe I can show that here a little bit. So basically what you probably did is you download either the rooted tree or the tree. Honestly, it makes no difference for that particular step. Um, you go to the ITOL website. And you probably uploaded it here. 
you could have put in a name if you wanted to, but you just go and upload. You choose the, choose the file, sorry. That tree file, for instance. You uploaded it, and then you kind of saw your tree. Um, and sometimes it's like kind of hard to see what's going on in those short regions here. So that's now the length is actually scaled by the actual difference in sequences. So you could kind of see that those things are fairly similar, but there's like that section of the tree that's really dim different. And if you kind of want to see that without the branch length, you just in that branch length option here, you say ignore. And it will kind of give you that cladogram where it's kind of rescaled a little bit. And then like what you probably did is take that plus button, upload the other data to kind of visualize it. You can also make it like non-circular, which sometimes is nicer if you want to read the labels. Then you can zoom in with your mouse wheel, for instance, which gives you like the same tree, but it's kind of aligned in a non-circular fashion. And yeah, we can basically, yeah, we can definitely post the code for the classifier. Some of the TAs can probably do that for whatever they ran. Yeah, we can also provide the solutions to you. Cool, yeah, thanks so much. So now we are kind of finished with that section. Um, awesome participation so far. I'm really happy with how everyone is asking questions on Slack. Like it's super cool to see um, so much curiosity and like, like also like very intelligent questions there. Um, so we are actually having a lunch break now, which might not be lunch for you. So I'm sorry if you're in a different time zone, it might actually be inconvenient, but we'll have like a half an hour break right now. And then we'll be back at 1230 hour time or in half an hour from now, basically to start with the MyCom tutorial. Thanks so much. And yeah, glad to have you all here.